Um, all right, hi everyone. Welcome back to um, another one of our Water Resources Research Center spring seminar uh, presentations. Um, this week we have Chris Kramer and Hina Ioane um, talking about restoration efforts at uh, Kalau Ha'i Ha'i Fish Pond and Kanevai Spring. So Chris Kramer is a historian and serves as the executive director of Mauna Loa Fish Pond Heritage Center. The center works to support community education and stewardship at Kanevai Spring and Kalau Ha'i Ha'i Fish Pond, some of the few remaining Punavai in East Oahu. Hina Ioane was born and raised in Palolo Valley, Oahu. She is a third year Chaminade University student majoring in environmental science. Her environmental science class with Dr. Lupita Ruiz Jones gathered water quality data during the fall 2022 and spring 2023 at Kanevai Spring and Kalau Ha'i Ha'i Fish Pond. And this data is being gathered in advance of a Vai restoration project at Kalau Ha'i Ha'i and the development project Malka of Kanevai Spring. So with that, um, I'll let the speakers take it away. Um, aloha mai kako. Uh, my name is Chris Kramer and um, thank you all for joining me and i um, glad to also be joining Hina Ioane from Chaminade University. So I'll share a little bit of the work that we've been doing and um, how we came to this drastic engineering solution, but it offers a lot of promise. So um, here's a 1930s map of Mauna Lua Bay and you can see the springs right at each of the ridge spurs. So right at the point of each ridge, there we go. So yeah, now you can see at the point of each ridge that the spur that's where the artesian freshwater springs are located and starting from the left you had Wai'alai, Wai'lupe, Kawai'ku'i, Lucas Spring which we're going to be talking about is um, the Hawaiian name is Kalau Ha'i Ha'i and then right over the next ridge spur over is Kanewai Spring and continuing you have the Barrow Spring so all of these have been destroyed. Um, and so Kalau Ha'i Ha'i and Kaniwai are the, the last remaining. Um, the rest have been either covered over or just barely trickle today. So um, a lot of impacts. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons that this happened was um, it was seen for a long, long time as wasting water if you let it flow to the ocean. So um you know they weren't they weren't seen as as um you know how important it was to the fishery and so that 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 was kind of the de facto policy for many years was cap the springs and um so they weren't well documented either and here you can see the near shore at Niu at Kalau Ha'i Ha'i and just abundant with life in the past here's in the 1880s the horses drinking right at new at kalau ha'i ha'i that fresh that life-giving fresh water and here's a view from up malka you can see the fish pond fed by that fresh water and you can also see that ulu niu the coconut grove and these are all dependent on those fresh water resources and this is Auntie Laura Thompson. Her family was the Konohiki of, of the whole valley. And these are her horses drinking or inside the spring at Kalau Ha'i Ha'i. And she really inspired us. Um, and she, she cherished the memories of all the clouds of opai in that spring and coming to the fresh water and the long strands of limu ele ele. And here's here's the her family dairy, um, the cows drinking in Kalau Ha'i Ha'i. Here's the um, the last keeper of that fish pond, Mr. Hara. He lived in a glass floor home over the fish pond, and you can see all the hole hole and freshwater mullet that were in there. This is the under under his home. And he just had this real deep connection with that fish pond. And the fishermen as well. This is Tony Costa, who, who grew up in that area. And 
always talked about that fresh water is the lifeblood of the fishery. And this is in the 1990s when they were widened the road and they punctured the aquifer or they punctured the lava tube and you can see it spewing out onto the road. And here's more photos of that. And this is the dewatering of the fish pond. So the pond went dry, everything died. Mr. Hara had a stroke. It was devastating for him and the family, the Lee family that lived there as well. And this is the concrete dam that was built um, to stop the water. So an entire concrete truck was brought in and um, to plug up the water. And so you can see before and after. Those footprints are Joe Kennedy's. Um, he was a, he did a study in 2010 on Haniwai and Kalau Ha'ihai. And you can see the near shore fishery, the effect on that as well. All the gorilla ogle moved in, you know, the whole chemistry and, and um, everything, everything changed without the fresh water. So community has been very active. The Mauna Loa Fish Pond Heritage Center, we brought schools and, you know, really tried to do what we can, but there's definite limits. Um, so one of the things that we found out, there was a million gallons of infiltration a day, right, in front of Kalau Ha'i Ha'i Fish Pond going into the sewer system. So once that pathway for the water to flow changed, the water went somewhere else and that was in the sewer. And so years and years later, uh, we started in 2007 um, after Mr. Hara had tried for many years and um, so now we're at the point where we finally this year um, we're, be, we're working with the state and RM Towel to do a directional drill project. So that's to do a trenchless drilling underneath the road, right across the highway to the Malka side, connecting the fish pond through a small diameter pipe. And this is really groundbreaking for Hawaii. It's, you hear lots of times where these resources are cut off, but you never hear of them being restored using the technology that we have. And directional drilling wasn't even that common when um, this highway widening happened. So today it's, it's used in Pearl Harbor and different places. It's a lot more common, but um, it's taken a long, long time for our community to have this option and it's very exciting to actually know that this year and next year we're going to know if it works so we won't know if we don't try and here's the boring crew and they're taking borings on the Malka side and they found that the artesian condition is you know it still comes to the same spot and on the right is a diagram of the trench it's going to go under the road and it's just a micro tunnel so it's not you don't have to rip up the road and so this is a, a little video on what directional drilling is it's pretty cool technology horizontal directional drilling is an efficient innovative way to bury pipe and cable under roads rivers or any other potential obstacles Drilling begins with establishing a bore path, locating existing utilities, and choosing locations of the entry and exit pits. It's important to properly and safely set up equipment at each location. Once the operator starts drilling, they're able to guide the drill pipe and track it using a tracking beacon. A tracker monitors the head of the drill string so they know depth, position and area of the housing. A fluid mixer mixes drilling fluids that flow through the drill to the end of the drill bit for more efficient cutting and cleaning of the borehole. Proper 
Drilling fluids are essential for success in various soil conditions. Excess drilling fluid is removed using a vacuum excavator. Once the pilot bore has been completed, it's typically enlarged to one and a half the size of the new conduit or pipe being installed. This is done by utilizing a back reamer, either by a multi-step process called pre-reaming, or utilizing a swivel and pulling in the product on the initial back ream. Mud mixture then fills the space around the piper cable. Each drilling project comes with its own set of challenges. From determining the right drill size and bit configuration, to understanding soil conditions, to proper HDD tooling selection, there's a lot to consider when executing a horizontal directional drilling project. Yeah, so that's the, um, a little how the process works. And so that's what's happening at Kalau Ha'i Ha'i right here at Lucas Spring. And meanwhile, we've, we've also been doing restoration and um, gathering data with Hina and she'll share about that shortly um, at Kanewai Spring. So you can see Kanewai is right here. And about six to eight months ago, um, we noticed the pond went dry. I mean, just out of the blue, um, uh, there's still there's still water in the spring itself, but it's just barely trickle trickles out now. And we looked Malka of us, and what did we see? We saw this construction fence went up, and with no permits, um, these uh, development project had begun. Um, they they had been taking down some of the old homes over there, and um, this is right where Okuna talked about the artesian geyser or fountain um, was encountered. So we were, we were very um, alarmed. And you can see up to the right is Elelupe Spring. Elelupe was the king's drinking water that was kapu. And so, and then it flows down along to the point of the ridge where you see this construction happening. And then further out, there was another artesian fountain or geyser three to four feet tall inside the fish pond. And that no longer happens as well. So, um, so it's, it's almost like history is repeating itself. We're seeing what happened at Kalau Ha'i Ha'i. And this is Kanewai in 2017. Um, you can see the clarity was very fresh. And then I took these photos today. Um, to the left, you see the Awai. And then this is this was this morning. The Awai is not flowing. It's barely even a trickle coming out. So big changes. Um, and so we hope that we don't have to do directional drilling, but it's in the we're trying to learn as much as we can. And um, we, we've that's why we're working with um, students and, and Shamanad to try to have a better understanding. Um, we did work with UH SOAS, um, Dr. Craig Glenn's students, um, Joe Kennedy in 2010. And so since that time, we, you know, we've seen these big shifts as well. So it's, there's a lot of data that we're still trying to gather and, and Kind of understand what's what's going on. So. so thank you all for um yeah listening and I'll turn it over to Hina now. Hi guys. So my name is Hina Iowane. Um and this is our project or or yeah this is our project on water monitoring at Kalauha Ihai and Kanevai. Um, this is in collaboration with the past three marine environmental science classes that I've been uh, teeing for. Oh, sorry. Okay, so just a little bit about me. Um, like Carrie said, I'm a third year at Chaminade University. I major in environmental science and I minor in environmental studies. And since spring 2022, I've been a teacher's assistant for Professor Lupita 
in her environmental um, marine science classes. Um, and then these are two out of the three classes that I've TA'd for. On the left is my current class that I'm TAing, the spring ENB 415 for 2023. And then on the right is last year's class from ENV 415 from 2022. So initial conditions when I first went to um, the springs, at Kanevai Spring, I first thought of like, it looked like a mini botanical garden. There was a variety of both terrestrial and aquatic life. And it was just really peaceful and nice to be around. On the picture in the left, that's a picture of Kanevai Spring itself. And then on the picture in the right, that's the picture of the water within the spring. If you look closely, you can actually see the floor, um, meaning the water is really clear and crisp and clean. And then here are a few more photos. This is when you first walk into Kanevai. Um, there's just a lot of plants surrounding the area and there's a lot of plants that Uncle Chris them are also growing and trying to propagate and put out. And then this is one of the classes uh, with Miss Lupita right here. And they're all talking about how we can deploy our loggers. And here's a few more photos. This is the back of Kanevai and then the stairs to which it points out to the pond on this side. And then this is my friend, Sasha. She's taking water samples in this back area. And then the initial uh, conditions of Kalauha Ihai, to me, it looked like a mini jungle just because um, we come in through the beach. So from the beach axis, you have to go through um, a lot of like bushes of plants, actually bushes of beach naupaka, but it's nice. And then you go through like a bunch of trees and then you get here and you see um, Kalauha Ihai, the pond. And as you can see, the water over here isn't as clear. There's a lot of pollution and it, it's st uh, stagnant. So when I first went in spring 2022, one of the days we were trying to do research, but we found a lot of fish dead and they were floating on the surface. They had a really bad smell. And it was just really like eye-opening to me. Like we do have to figure out what's going on and how we can help so that this doesn't happen in the future. So for our lab projects, we started in spring of 2022. Um, our students have worked in small groups to collect temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, and conductivity data. And this data just helps us to understand the environment around us. It gives us data to understand the conditions that the organisms are experiencing, um, both short-term and long-term. And then it also allows us to monitor the health of both fish ponds over time. And we can use this data to educate others of our findings and we can get more people involved in these projects. So for our 2022 data, Here's a picture of our loggers. Um, they're all from a company called Onset. And then the data we collected are temperature, pH, oxygen, and conductivity. And these are all of our loggers. So that's temperature, conductivity, oh, pH, and oxygen. And then for our methods for temperature, we took 10 minute sampling intervals. We started in um, we started in June, June 10th to October 10th. And then for pH and oxygen, we also did 10 minute sampling intervals. And we started in October 6th to November 10th. And then um, for our aqua probe, this is just to double check that our, our loggers that are out in the field for a longer time are taking accurate data. And then these are some of our graphs. So this is our temperature graph for Kalau Ha'i Ha'i. Um, we measured in Celsius. This is from October to November. And then we got a high of 28.27 degrees, right around here. And then we got a low of 24.10 degrees Celsius. That's around here. And as you can see from October to November, the temperature just kind of 
comes on a decline. It has a little up right here, but then comes back, back down. And then this is our temperature for Conivai. Um, we actually had four temperature loggers at Conivai. So we also measured these in Celsius. We got a high of 32.87 degrees Celsius. That'll be in the blue graph right over here. And then we got a low of 18 point, oh, sorry, green graph up here. And then a low of 18.77 degrees Celsius. That'll be in the low graph right here. And all of the temperatures will be within that range. But they were all placed at different um, sites. So we have the um, the LY, so right at the end when the when the pond is connecting to um, like another body of water. And then the fish pond ledge, so that's this green, the green graph with the highest temperature. The um, shade under the Christmas berry tree. So that'll be this blue graph with the lowest temperature. And then the kind of ice spring ledge will be this purple graph. And then for pH, this will be our data from fall 2022 from October to November. And this is um, the pH that's only at Kalauha'ihai. This shows how acidic or alkaline the water gets. As you can see, it kind of stays between a neutral range with a high of 7.85 and a low of 7.34. And then this is the dissolved oxygen, also taken in fall 2022 from October to November. This one is only at Kalauha'ihai as well. So this one was measured in um, per unit volume of water, milligrams per liter. So we have a high of 10.93. That'll be this one. And then a low of negative 0 0.05. I believe it's this one. And then currently um, we do have loggers at both sites. I'm excited for the upcoming data that's gonna come out because now we have um, We'll have pH and dissolved oxygen data from Kanevai as well as Kalauha'ihai. So right now at Kalauha'ihai, we have two temperature loggers, one conductivity sensor, one pH sensor, and one oxygen sensor. And then at Kanevai, we have four temperature loggers, one conductivity sensor, one pH sensor, and one oxygen sensor. And then we're still in the process of interpreting this data from spring 2023. Sorry guys, I just wanna go back. So the importance of knowing the dissolved oxygen and pH levels, because at night, um, there's a lot more respiration. And so that bring, that adds a lot more carbonic acid to the water and there's no photosynthesis going on. So there's no oxygen going into the water. So, um, it lowers, uh, yeah, it lowers the pH and it also lowers the dissolved oxygen. In moments like these, it could, like in extreme moments, it could um, lead to a hypoxic situation, which isn't good for the fish or any other living organisms in the pond. But um, yeah, like that's what might have happened when the fish were all dead floating on the surface. And we just want to prevent that in the future. So thank you. OK, so seems like we have quite a bit of time for questions. Uh, thank you to both of the speakers. Um, so yeah, feel free to enter any questions into the chat. Um, or if you want, please raise your hand, and I will uh, enable you to unmute. Um, Aurora said, uh, can you connect the sensor data to what Chris was mentioning about the changes in flow? Who is that question for? Is that 
Um, you know, right? I think either. I think we're in process right now of this. Um, I mean, it, it's it was such an unexpected um, thing to happen to see Kanewai just all of a sudden the water level just dropped and now we see the fish gulping at the top, you know, and so it's, um, but yeah, we're definitely, I think, gonna try to shift so we, we can make these connections. We definitely need help too. <laughs> um, I, I definitely think you can connect the sensor data to what Uncle Chris is mentioning about the changes in water flow. Um, I'm sorry I didn't show you guys, but if you look at it, Kane, Kanewai has like, it's not much of a difference, but it has about um, lower temperature, about one degree Celsius lower than um, Kalau Ha'ihai. So you'll see changes in temperature and you'll also, hopefully you'll also see um, changes in like pH and oxygen, uh, dissolved oxygen levels, just to show that um, the fish are getting as much oxygen as they need, as long as the other organisms are as well as. <laughs> oh, real quick, Chris, uh, would you be able to turn your camera back on for the yeah. Q&A? Last time it <laughs> <laughs> threw everything off. Let me see if I can go on again. Getting a lot of questions coming in. There we okay. go, there we go, okay. Um, um, so the second question is uh, say from Eric saying, this data logging is so exciting. Uh, what would it take to expand this logging to many more sites? Um, if you have any sites in mind, you can contact me or my professor Lupita and we can see what we can do. Hopefully we can go to those sites as well and take uh, temperature, pH, conductivity, and dissolved oxygen data is there as well. I feel like it'll help and it'll have a positive impact to have data just so that having data and numbers to show allows us to be able to um, enforce different policies and um, make changes. Uh, next question, uh, are the changes, Philip asked, are the changes in the data connected to tidal changes? It definitely is. Um, especially in the Awai, the Awai is closer to where the ocean and the spring and ponds meet each other. So in those areas, the conductivity levels will definitely depend on the tidal change, just because the salt water coming in does, does add more salt water. And then when it's lower tide, there's more, um, or there's less salt water. Uh, Weston says, um, in those dates of data, is there a correlate to the dates uh, the fish died? Um, maybe the dates of lowest oxygenation. No, there actually isn't. I wish there was just just because um, we had that happen, so we would have known the variables at which though that happened. Um, it didn't happen again, which is a good thing, but um, it it would have been really good to have that data, you know. I'm so sorry. Yeah, we didn't we didn't have the loggers in at that time. Um, seems like uh, Professor Lupita said uh, the stagnant water flow at Kalahaihai makes it so the oxygen drops low. That's it, my professor, I, guys. Uh, yeah. Uncle Chris. Uh, it it also I just could add too that we had um, sulfide gas. I mean, it was just so, I mean, it was overpowering. You could smell from the, from the road even. It was like, it was, it was overpowering the sulfide gas and it was coming from the um, on. Um, 
Next question from Aurora. I'm not sure if that's a follow up to your previous question saying what month was that, um, but would you expect to see changes in salinity, uh, increasing salinity or Sorry, do you want to unmute and ask that? Yeah, <laughs> sure. sure. That was, it was a follow-up from my previous, but I think all of us are kind of curious about piecing together the different streams of information you have, plus the sort of observations um, of timing. And so I guess my first question is like, you know, when, Chris, did you see, sorry, I'll put my camera on. Did you see, how's it? Um, when did you see the changes in flow? Like what months was that? And did the data, you know, that you have span that period? And then, because I, right. without having any data, I would expect to see certain changes in the sense. Right. If they don't overlap, then it's kind of. Sure. Usually you have, you know, at the end of the summer or, or like during when the wind backs off, you have fish die off. That's kind of normal for the local uh, when the when the oxygen levels drop, but um, you wouldn't expect to see, you know, like these low water levels in this month. You know, like this time of year, it's not it's very unusual, right, to have. Um, so that that's that's kind of um, something unusual. Is like we're we're in the rainy season now and, and we're still having these real low water levels and the fish gulping and things like that. And that's but, data Hina you're processing right now, yeah. I uh, yes. Okay. For to answer your question, um like we would see changes in salinity. I'm not sure um exactly like in i'm not sure exactly when like in in referring to the tidal influence but i would expect it to be like when we have the highest tides and like lowest tides like maybe like king tides and like uncle chris said like at the end of the summer i know we have king tides during the summer and the winter yeah, I know more research. Changes, and get back. If you have changes if you have decreasing freshwater flow, the flow that up and down from the tidal influence, not just in height but in salinity, you would see in your sensor data. So that's what I just wanted to suggest: is like if you know what window of time Uncle Chris mm -hmm. is seeing stuff, then you can go look at your data at that window and see if it matches kind of what you would expect. Um, from, so sorry, I co-opted time. There's more questions. Okay, uh, next one. Um, I'm not sure if Craig, you found your answer. Uh, Craig was wondering about how you differentiate between the effects of uh, seawater uh, from the ocean and groundwater, um, but followed up with the conductivity logger. Um, so was that how you? how you differentiate between the two inputs. Um, yeah, um, mostly through the conductivity loggers just to see the salinity and um, the time of day to associate how much, uh, if there's low tides or high tides and how much of water is coming in. Okay, next question from Ken. Uh, have you considered using the EM technology, which is what uh, the Genki Alawai project uses to help, uh, I think, cleaning up the Alawai? Um, says, I believe it also helps with oxygenation of the water, but not 100% sure. We, we did actually, yeah, we did use that. Um, you know, did you see on the data any, um, I I I go off non-instrument kind of up I, I use you know kilo and observation. So I I would have to um defer to Tina on the data if, if there was changes that or, or how that affected it. Um, I'm so sorry. I actually I was there when Uncle Chris um had those 
those Genki balls are he actually yeah. had the buckets but um I didn't look at any data to like associate it with that's a really good thing to do though so I I can get back to you on that and um I'll see if there's any difference in um oxygen or dissolved oxygen it did take about a month to notice the clarity change in the I mean it was like kind of um it, it was just this toxic brew and then it you know after the em was added it kind of all turned like like a science experiment or something it like kind of turned red reddish and then after about a month it kind of settled down and um went back to clear um so Lupita said that she can weigh in on some things. Um, I'll enable her to unmute um, if she wants to. Um, aloha. Hi. Um, so I um, have had the pleasure of working with Chris and with Hina. Um, and I just want to kind of share a little bit of my observations. Um, the We started collecting temperature data in early 2022 and started to just see that there's a lot of spatial variation in um, in the in those temperature data and I think it really highlighted that there are places where the water is flowing um, places where the water is stagnant um, and I think we're still the one next step that um, we're considering doing is to start to actually take better measurements of water level so we can actually um, associate uh, changes in water level with some of these like more stagnant areas um, of the, the fish pond in the spring. Um, and then the, I think the pH and oxygen data are very interesting because uh, like Hina mentioned, it really does kind of highlight the, um, the diurnal fluctuations in photosynthesis and respiration. Um, and I think because the water at Kalao Hai Hai is so stagnant. That's why we saw these really extreme oxygen fluctuations um, with it getting to hypoxic levels at night. Um, I'm still trying to learn and figure out um, what uh, the influence of the tidal cycle is in, with some of these parameters, um, but definitely open to hearing ideas of um, things to look at um, and yeah, if there are any other questions too, I can do my best to address them along with Chris and Hina. Okay, um, so Andrew asked for you, Chris, um, at Kanevai, have you checked to see if the pump station downstream on the sewages line has a higher flow volume uh, since the water shut off from reaching the spring? That's that's a real good um, thing. No, we we haven't, um, but yeah, that's something definitely we'll we will follow up, follow up on. Uh, followed up with a comment saying, uh, "Had I had a pressure transducer in Kanevai for four months back in, I'm not sure what year that is, um, but the water level was a function of the tidal flux and salinity, and the pond was consistently fresh." I mean, you could drink it before. That was how fresh it was and just crystal clear. And every kind of fish that you can imagine is, is, is in there. All the native opu and, and oh, not all of them, but there's three different species of opu and opai and just lots of native life and endangered species all come to Kaniwai. But um, that's going to change if as this well, hopefully things will work their work their self out but yeah okay a uh, comment from joe uh aloha chris super cool to hear about the possibility of using directional drilling to potentially connect the pond to the water source once again so yeah joe joe for for those of you who haven't um 
met him. He's he did some real groundbreaking studies um, when they were sealing the main sewer line in 2010, and um, you could totally see the water level coming up every as they were lining the main sewer line, um, and it was like unbelievable to see it come back. However, the the artesian condition that happened before never returned. So the water still doesn't um, have that, that strong flow like it did. It just kind of dri dribbles in and seeps in. But we're hoping that this, this is such a, um, has such potential for other communities, you know, that if this is successful, it'll, we can duplicate it and um, restore the Vai to other other communities as well. I wanted to, um, sorry, since Joe is on the line, uh, he, he tried to reply all, but he DM'd me. Joe, can you add your comment? Can you vocalize your comment? Oh, there you go. So he had, when I did my study of both ponds over a decade ago, Kaneway would get flooded by peak spring high tides, but did you have any other insights? Do you yeah. want me to uh, um, give uh, unmute? Yeah. Can, you, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Other. Yeah, I just remember like every peak spring high tide. So it was kind of on like that two week cycle where uh, the conductivity would spike and get close to sort of ocean levels. And then it would drop back down um, after each sort of uh, that series of a, a couple high tides. And then the water would clear up and get back to sort of really low conductivities. And then two weeks later, um, it, it spike again. And one of the things that kind of helped uh, determine that was a combination of having a water level along with the conductivity. So you kind of had that, realize you see like peaks in that, um, in the water level within each, uh, well, especially kind of why within kind of why, um, and be able to sort of tie that together with the increase in conductivity. Um, but it's been a long time since I've been there, so I have no idea what's going on now. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Harry, I'm going to jump on. I see and Andy Hood. Did you want to? I, I saw you put it something in the chat, but we can also unmute you. I think. You there? Here we go. Hello. You can hear, we can hear you. Hey, Chris, how's it? Um, hey, how's it? Uh, I'll just kind of second what's already been stated. So, I, Chris, it's been a long time, but I think it was in 2013 we had our transducers out there. Exactly mm -hmm. what Joe was saying: the 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 king tides and the higher tides raised the water level up. We did a couple profiles from the bed of the of the Kaniwai Spring up to the surface. The salinity, while it did change, it wasn't an appreciable change. Um, and the temperature, I'm, I'm, I'm actually just pulled up our plots that we did for you guys. Um, you know, there were temperature fluxes as well. Um, but I think more importantly, if I, I would like, maybe we could catch up offline. Um, if there's work going on across the road and it's changing flow and it's, it seems like it must be more than coincidental because what I'm looking at from the data is even in the dry season when we collected water level, that water level always remained fairly, that pond, the spring remained fairly deep throughout the whole period. And then I even see that there's other periods when we came over with our YSI and did some measurements as well. So um, who knows what they're doing, Malka, but it, uh, it sounds, like more than just coincidental. So maybe there's more, it's an investigation. And if one of your students that's doing some work out there wants to uh, come by and pick up a couple of pressure transducers and throw them in there, I have a couple fitted with temperature and conductivity. They could put them in and, and 
correlate water level again if you want to reoccupy the sampling station. Awesome. Yeah, it's, that would that would be really helpful. Okay. Uh, Craig asks, how far along are you with the slant drilling? Um, so right now they they're scheduling the um, they just they came yesterday the geolab um, engineers to mark the utility lines and that's that's one thing that complicates it is there's a lot of traffic of utilities under the road so um, they got to get different permits and things so that that's the actual job is is a is is not it's a short um, repair, but it's the permitting and, and um, that, so that that's gonna take some time. So probably uh, through this year and next year, that it, that's gonna be ongoing, um, but it is funded. So that's that's another key part. Um, and when, when it was damaged in the 1990s, um, you know, it, it was like, um, the homeowner that lived there, Mr. Hara, he was condemned and they said, well, we can never fix it. So, you know, we'll just condemn the spring. And um, it, 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 the feeling was that it could never be fixed. But um, yeah, with these advances in technology, it's not such an unusual thing now for directional drilling. Um, Craig had a short follow-up question, so I'll ask that first, but then Ken, after that, I think I'm going to give you an unmute option, uh, since that seemed like a more complicated discussion. Um, so first, Craig's uh, question, is there any evidence that the sewer lines are leaking again? Um, the last few years, they've been lining them, and um, I looked on their camera, and, and you could see there's still lots of water flowing in the sewer line, uh, a lot of fresh water infiltration, um, but they were sealing them. Um, so I, I think it's just a continuing issue because they these sewer lines, they're the low point and they run right through this, this area of high groundwater. Um, so it's, they're, they're, whenever there's any, pathway, they just, all the groundwater goes in. So. Okay, uh, Ken, I'm gonna give you the option to unmute so that you can um, go more into detail on your point. Yeah, thanks, uh, Gary. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a real uh, follow-up on my question about um, how the EM technology can address the oxy oxygenation aspect and I just went and looked at the, the data just went to the website and looked at their data and it does have a very significant impact on oxygenation as well as a number of other contaminants which the DOH water quality group um, have been monitoring so it I, I think it's still a potential tool that you might consider in addressing some of the issues that you're faced with mm. yeah you know the <laughs> Um, there's been a lot of uh, PR on the Genki Alawai project, and um, <clears throat> when the Jefferson School, you know, which is the Kapuhulu and British stagnant area of the canal, and they deployed, I think, 600 Genki balls, and I think about, as Chris, you said, um, a month or a month and a half later, they went back and the six to eight inches of organic sludge, you know, all that mud, was completely dissolved away. You can see the sandy bottom and decided to see uh, marine fish like Veke. And I think he said also Moy uh, at that back end of that canal. So, um, and recently a teacher from Alawai Elementary who loves to fish caught a two pound papillo um, <clears throat> just, just whipping from the, um, the, the edge of the canal. So, you know, they, I mean, they've seen a green sea turtle a manta ray has been seen in the canal now, um, mm -hmm. and most recently a um, monk seal 
was seen, seen swimming in the canal. So, uh, you know, clearly there's some positive impact in using this technology as a tool for uh, mitigating some of the uh, pollutants and the uh, contaminants that um, that's clearly has been in the canal, but hopefully with further <clears throat> uh, deployment of this tool that we can actually begin to clean up that canal. Yeah, it was it was um, definitely in, we we used uh, super soakers too for the the students to, and and different ways to get it in the in there. But it was hard to tell if it if the changes were just like that it would go back naturally on its own like that, or if it was from the EM. Wasn't sure. But I mean, the pond is, is um, that Kalau Ha'i Ha'i is not, I mean, you wouldn't want to eat from there like before, because it's going to, everything is going to taste like mud, right? It's not flowing like it did. Um, so it just, it's, it's not a healthy pond just because of the, the damages. All right. Um... Unless there's any more questions, I, I noticed in the chat, um, it seems like a working group has been suggested for data wrangling. Um, so if anyone missed that um, or is interested in that um, and you, you you don't have the chance to get in touch with the speaker, you can always um, email me. Um, I'll put my email in the chat as well if you need to follow up on anything. Um, and I can help you, I can help connect you with anybody um, that you might have missed. Um, so yeah, if there's not any other questions, um, oh, looks like there's one last, we'll take this one as the last question. Um, so Robert asks, uh, for the directional drilling, are the drilling fluids and mud mixture environmentally favorable? Um, from what I understand, they, they suck it all out into kind of a vacuum or something that captures whatever is pushed into the um, the directional drilling um, tunnel. So I don't, I don't think it, I, I, I don't know exactly what um, fluids or mud is, is gonna be used, but um, that was what I understand is it, it all gets sucked out and captured. I know it's um, Pearl Harbor, and um, it's a number of other places they they've used it very successfully because it 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 goes and takes a dive under the road and then comes back up. So it's um, you know it, it's pretty neat to how they how they pull it off around all the utilities and things that are under there. Okay, um, I think that should do it for us this week. Um, thank you to our speakers once again. I really appreciate you joining us for our seminar. Um, yeah, so next week we have, or not next week, sorry, the next seminar uh, in two weeks will be um, Mia Comeros and Chris Schuler talking about uh, integrated bridge to reef studies in American Samoa. Um, let's see, anything else? Uh, yes, a recording of this will be available um, after um, we have to do a transcription for it and uh, get permission from the speakers to post it. But uh, yeah, we generally try to make a recording available. Um, and yeah, with that, I think I'll say one final thank you to the speakers and thank you to uh, the audience for joining us this Friday and hope you have a good weekend. Thank you everyone. This is a great opportunity.